We'll do both ionic and covalent, so go ahead and get out a periodic table and a common ion sheet. You're going to need both for this. All right, we'll go through these one at a time and talk about how we're going to name each of them. In this case, we're all, they're all formulas, and so we're going to convert those over into names. So the first thing I always do is identify the molecule as ionic or covalent. The way you do that is looking at what types of elements make up the compound. So in this case, with the first one, we have sulfur and we have oxygen. This would be a nonmetal, that would be a nonmetal. So if we have two nonmetals, this would be a covalent compound. Covalent compounds, they use the prefixes, so we have to identify how many of each element there is using a prefix and put them together, making sure we change the second element to IDE. So in this case, we have one sulfur, which would be monosulfur normally, but we never use mono on the first element, and so it's just going to be sulfur. And then since we have three oxygens, the prefix for three is tri, and so this is going to be tri. We don't say oxygen, we say oxides. We change oxygen to oxide. So sulfur trioxide. All right, the next one, let's identify what type that is. So we have a metal, and then we have SCN. So that's three elements together. I'm going to go ahead and look on my common ion sheet and see if I can see anything similar to that on there. Oh, yeah, sure enough, there it is. So that means that's a polyatomic ion that's attached to iron. So we have a cation anion that would make this an ionic compound. Now, I've also noticed that iron is a transition metal, which means it's one of those elements that are in the middle, the D block, and so that's going to have special naming rules then, it needs those uh, Roman numerals to specify its charge. So we need to figure out what the charge of iron is as well when we write the formula for this, or the name for this. So we know that iron's going to be positive charge, we just don't know what positive it will be. But we can look at our SCN, and so SCN we see on our common ion sheet has a negative charge. And we have three of those. We have three SCNs. And so if we have three SCNs, that's a grand total of one, two, three negatives. So we have a total of three negatives. And if we have one iron, and iron has a positive charge to cancel out those three negatives, that means that one iron that we have would have to have a three positive charge. That makes a grand total of 3 plus, 3 minus, 0. And that's always the goal for an ionic compound. So in that case, that means that iron has a charge of plus 3, and so it's going to be iron 3 in this case. And then SCN, that's thiocyanate. We don't use uh, prefixes, so we don't put tri-thiocyanate, we just put thiocyanate. So the complete name would be iron 3-thiocyanate. All right, next in line, we have nitrogen and sulfur bonded together. Uh, nitrogen is a nonmetal, and so is sulfur, so that means this is another covalent compound. So we're going to have to use prefixes. And we have two nitrogens, and the prefix for two is di. So it's going to be di-nitrogen. Nitrogen stays the same since the first element. And then we have three sulfurs. The prefix for three is tri. We don't say trisulfur, though, since it's the second element. We change it to IDE, so it would be trisulfide. All right, let's move on to the fourth one. So we have a metal here, and then we have another BrO3, so it looks like it's going to be a polyatomic ion. Quick scan of the sheet. Sure enough, there it is right there. So we have another ionic compound on our hands. So that means no prefixes. In this case, potassium, that's a group 1 metal, so it is not a transition metal. That means we do not need Roman numerals. Potassium is always plus 1. It's always plus 1 because it's always got one valence electron that it wants to get rid of. So in this case, no Roman numerals. We can just write the name straight up. So K is potassium, and so we call that potassium. BrO3 is bromate, and so we call that bromate. So in this case, the name of that compound is going to be potassium bromate. And then finally, Br8Cl3. So right here we have a nonmetal, nonmetal. So that means we've got another covalent compound. The prefix for 8 is octa. And then that's bromine, so it would be octabromine. And then the prefix for 3 is tri. And so it's going to be trichloride. So there you go. That's uh, converting from formulas into names. I think the hardest part for this is just going to be to remember to identify covalent versus ionic. And then once you've got those two, naming should be fairly simple. Just remembering a couple tricks such as watching out for those transition metals. So it's the transition metals plus lead and tin, PB, SN. Those would be the other elements that all have to have Roman numerals. 
And then when you're looking at the common ions, making sure that you're looking at the correct one. Some of them have very similar formulas like nitrate and nitrite, NO3 and NO2. So make sure you double check on all of those. All right, now let's go the other way. Let's start with a name and convert it to a formula. Nice part about going this way is identifying a covalent versus an ionic is pretty simple. If you see prefixes, it must be a covalent compound. If you don't see any prefixes, it's probably an ionic compound. However, when you write the formulas, then you've got to be able to convert both prefixes into numbers, and you have to be able to balance charges when you write ionic compounds. All right, so this first one, ammonium and carbonate, I don't see prefixes, and if I glance real quick at my common ion sheet, yeah, both of those are on there. So I've actually got two common ions in this case. Ammonium is NH4+, plus, so it's got a positive 1 charge, and carbonate is CO3+, two minus, so it has a 2 negative charge. Now I'm going to put those two together to make a formula. Remember, the goal of an ionic compound is two ions coming together and canceling out charges. So if we were to put these right together, we've got a plus 1 and minus 2. That wouldn't cancel out, so it doesn't work like that. We've got to make it so those charges are equal. So if we've got 1 plus and 2 minus, that means we're going to need two positive charges in order to get a match with the two negatives. So right now we've got 2 plus, 2 minus. So then when we write this formula, we need to put NH4, and since it's a polyatomic ion, we have more than one. Need to put parentheses around it in the two. So that tells the reader there's two of the ammonias, just like that. So we have two ammonias and then one carbonate, so no prefix or no uh, parentheses needed. So NH4, 2, CO3, that would be ammonium carbonate. And on the next one, I see some prefixes. We've got a di and we've got a hexa. So those both mean numbers. We transfer those numbers into the formula. So diboron, boron being 2, or B, and then we put a 2 on that for the di. And then hydride, remember we had the IDE, so we've got to kind of go backwards and figure out what would come from hydride, and that would be, I assume, hydrogen. And we've got hexa, which is 6, and so it would be B2H6. And then the next one, I see another prefix. So that means we've got another covalent compound here. There's no prefix on that first element, so that's, I'm going to assume then, one. So we leave that mono off, so it must be one nitrogen. So it's going to be N. And then tri bromide, so bromide would be Br, and tri is three. Next, magnesium perchlorate. So I see a metal there, and I don't see any prefixes, so that's going to be another ionic compound. Let's go to our ion sheet and find those two so we can look at their charges. So magnesium, which is a group 2 metal, it's in the second group on the periodic table, is going to have a plus 2 charge when it forms an ion, so Mg plus 2. And then perchlorate is going to be ClO4 minus. So on this one, we've already got two positive, and we've only got a minus one. So if we've only got one negative, we need to get two negatives, and we do that by using two per chlorates. So when we write the formula, we only need the one magnesium, that's two plus, and then for the chlorates, we would need two of those, and so I'm going to have to put parentheses around that, and then a two on the outside. That'll give us two negative, two positive, and there's magnesium per chlorate. Then finally, vandium, V-oxalate. And so that V right there, that's not the symbol for vandium. That's actually the Roman numeral, 5. So it doesn't mean there's 5 vandiums. It means vandium has a charge of plus 5. And then oxalate, common ion. We go to our common ion sheet. We see that it's C2O4, 2 minus. Now this one's going to be a little bit trickier because we've got a 5 plus and a 2 minus. So we can't just put 5 of those because if we put 5 of those, we would have 10 minus. And that wouldn't match up with this still. We would have 5 plus. But if we did put 5 of those and got ourselves a 10 minus charge, we could make 2 of these to get a 10 plus charge. So let's give ourselves some room real quick just so we can see this one a little bit better. So we've got vanadium plus 5 and an oxalate. So then if we went with 5 oxalates, so times 5, that would give us a grand total of 10 negative as a charge. And then if we went with times 2, 
of the vandiums, that would give us a grand total of 10 positives. And then 10 plus, 10 minus, hey, those cancel out great. So that means we could have a formula if we use two vandiums and then five oxalates. So to combine those two together with that many, it would be V2, so that's two vandiums, and then C2, O4, and since we're going to have more than one of those, let's put parentheses, and we're going to need five out there. Okay, so that's a fairly quick refresher on naming. Hopefully it helped you out a little bit. There are some practice problems on the website. Give those a shot. Check your answer. This is going to be a big part of the test and the rest of this year, really, being able to name uh, compounds and convert formulas into names.